Hi, this is sort of an answer to a question I got about progressive things, uh, progressive sanctification and what are my views on it. And um, I want to try to keep this short. Um, I did respond, but I thought maybe it'd be good to say something. Um, New Testament wise, I, I tend to be pretty strict about use of words and stuff, or I try to be. That doesn't mean I'm right all the time, but if I'm wrong, I go back and try to correct it, you know. Um, the New Testament tells us that we've been sanctified uh, by the offering of Jesus Christ, right? And some people say that's positional sanctification and try to distinguish it from disposition, dispositional sanctification or progressive sanctification. Um, now, there is one verse that says we should pursue sanctification and peace with all men, without which no one will see the Lord. Um, but strictly speaking, sanctification is something that God did when he set us apart for himself and marked us as his own. And in the Old Testament, you know, whatever touched the altar, the altar was most holy and it was sanctified by blood. And whatever touched the altar became most holy. So that's why Jesus tells the, you know, Pharisees, they're like, well, what, he says, what sanctifies the altar? You're what sanctifies your gift the gift or the altar it's the altar that sanctifies the gift so they were trying to look at their work as something that made them holy and when they put their gift on the altar it was almost like they were saying their gift sanctified the altar but no it's the other way around the altar makes the offering holy because the altar is really the blood of Jesus has been offered and we are what's presented on that offer uh, altar as those who are presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. We are most holy because of our union with Christ and our contact with that altar. And that's how God designates us. Now, as far as progressive sanctification goes, technically from the scriptures, there's no such thing, but there is a person who is our sanctification and that's another thing is sanctification is not a thing or an event. It is a person because first Corinthians one thirty says Christ is made to of God. Are you in Christ who is made unto us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. In every case, he is the thing. So he is our wisdom, which causes us to know him as God's wisdom and gives us his mind so that we can understand who he is. And then he's our righteousness. He became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And the way he does that is he becomes our righteousness and he's our qualification. And he is the righteousness, which exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which is descri uh, described as the requirement for entering into the kingdom in Matthew 7, right? And in Romans, it is he is the righteousness of God manifested, witnessed by the law and the prophets and manifested on those who believe in him. And then he is our sanctification. So what does that look like? So it really comes down to Galatians 2.20, that uh, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Christ is the life. He is my life. He is my righteousness. He is my sanctification. He's going to be my redemption. And he's also my very life. And Paul presented the Christian life, not as something you do, but as the life of the Son of God magnified in you and lived out through you. And when Paul talked about the Spirit, he was referring to the Spirit of life, the life-giving Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the practical uh, expression and realization of Christ's life in us. That's the Spirit. So when Paul talks about holy living, really he's talking about walking and living by the Spirit. Now, Galatians 3 
is the secret. And I talk about this in a message called uh, How to Walk by the Spirit by Faith. But Galatians 3 is the secret to how to walk in the Spirit. He says, did you receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith or by the works of the law? Are you so foolish, having begun in the f- Spirit, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? Okay, so it the question is, number one, we need to walk in the spirit or or the flesh, right? We're not going to walk in the flesh. We want to walk in the spirit because the spirit is the life of Christ flowing through us to produce his fruits. That's how the branches bear the fruit of the vine. It is by the spirit's flow, bringing us the life of the son of God. But we are confused about how that happens. And I've been a charismatic and I've been a mystic and a, I, I've never been a straight legalist. I, I, I started out as a charismatic and I distinguish these. Not everybody does, but I look at it as there's a mystical kind of legalism where, you know, the reform people who are just straight legalists, they don't even see the spirit. They just look at it as I need to obey the law. You know, the charismatics know they need the spirit. But they don't really understand the Spirit, and they don't see that the Spirit is the life of Christ flowing. They see him as a power, and they do various things to try to run in and bump into him. And sometimes, like I say, they accidentally do. And I've participated in that, you know. Um, Various things you try to do to get in the Spirit, and you hope that'll set you free to live in the Spirit. And we were under a cloudy view that uh, of sinless perfection, that, that if we could get into the spirit, we would be brought to a place of sinless perfection that would be sanctification, you know. Well, then the mystics, uh, or the inner life mystics, were a little more sophisticated, and they said, no, the spirit is Christ. He is the spirit of Christ, and he is Christ realized in you, and our life is to be a life of Christ. And we have this indwelling spirit as the fountain of living water within us. And we need to learn to partake of him. And there were a whole other set of practices on how to do that. That were a little more quiet than the charismatics. It was a little clearer in the vision, but still something eluded us. Which was, how is the spirit supplied? That's the thing. And... What I finally saw in Galatians 3 is that the Spirit is supplied through the hearing of faith. So we don't try to bump into the Spirit and run around and get the Spirit and do all these practices to try to get our flesh into the Spirit. It's by the hearing of faith that he is supplied. And that hearing of faith is the gospel. And, you know, that's why Paul calls the gospel the gospel of our salvation. And he calls it the power of God unto salvation. Because when it comes to you and you believe it, it not only describes something, but it supplies what it describes, which is the person of Christ as your wisdom, as your righteousness, as your sanctification, and as your very life, and ultimately as your redemption. And the whole thing works not by your striving, but by your believing the gospel. So it's extremely important that you have a right apprehension of the gospel, which is not just the initial forgiveness of sins, but the whole thing that God has provided for us in Christ. And that's a lot of what I focus on. Um, the Then we learn to preach the gospel to ourselves. And when we do that, it eradicates our fears, assures our heart before God, sprinkles us with the living water, sprinkles our body so that we can come boldly to him and stand in his presence. And then we are at peace with ourselves and peace with God. And we know that we are accepted in the beloved. And when we are in that position of peace and in that position of rest, because we believe in the gospel, we automatically have the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is really what progressive sanctification is talking about. There's no such thing. You are either in the flesh or in the Spirit. You are sanctified. But what do you express? Do you express the flesh with its works? Or do you express the Spirit and His fruit? 
And that goes up and down. Peter got saved and converted and did really well for quite some time. But 10 years after all that, do you remember that Paul had to rebuke him to his face in front of everybody because he was vacillating in fear of the Jews and the brothers sent from James? What is that? That's his flesh. Your flesh can come out at any time. And if you don't get clear about that, it'll come and surprise you. And that is part of the problem. Some people go into extreme sin because the flesh came out, snuck out and surprised them saying, hey, I'm still here. You thought I was gone. You thought you had progressively sanctified yourself and I was no longer around anymore to worry about. Well, guess what? Here I am. So he is always there and always has to be put down by the power of the cross and always has to be subjected to the spirit. And so it is by the spirit that you put to death the deeds of the body so that you can live. And the only way to have the spirit flowing, you can't control the spirit. He is God, but he has set it up so that if you are believing, he is flowing. And that is the key. It is to get your eyes off yourself. Sanctification, and I don't even hardly like to use the word only because we misuse it so much that it's become a loaded term. Walking in the Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit is a more accurate way to say it. Comes not by staring at myself and reading books about how to walk in love and how to walk in peace and how to walk in goodness and what does self control look like and what does kindness look like. You know, there's so many ministries that stay in business just by spinning out the fruits of the spirit as a work system that they can spend a thousand message on. It's ridiculous. We don't need that. We have a shortcut. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we're enjoying and believing the reality that is described in the gospel as our provision and realizing that it's all on Jesus Christ and it's his life that must be manifested. And we thank the father that he has provided that life to us and we are at peace with him. Then we stop looking at ourselves and we're now looking at Jesus. And you know what comes out of that? Peace and the rest of the fruits of the spirit without us even knowing it's happening. In fact, it's dangerous because if you go back and go, hey, I'm producing the fruit of the Spirit, look at me. You know what? You're back in the flesh and you're looking at yourself again. That's the mind of the flesh. And what comes next is flesh, either religious self-righteousness or falling back into various sins because you just lost the source of your strength by getting your eyes off Jesus and back on yourself. So that's what it means to be crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and the life I live is now lived by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I recognize that it must be Christ. Me is unacceptable. I am unacceptable. I've been refused. That's why God condemned me and put me on the cross with Christ. And now it must be resurrection. It must be life and it must be the Spirit flowing for anything to happen that's going to count for God. And you don't need to sit there and worry about whether or not you're in the spirit. That's not the key. You set your mind on the gospel. Pursue the truth of the gospel. What has God provided for me as my inheritance in Christ? And the more you get that clear, the happier you'll be. And the freer the spirit will flow. And people will say, my goodness, you're a different kind of person. And you won't say, I know. You'll say, oh my goodness, please get the attention off me. Because if you cause me to look at myself again, it'll all disappear in a heartbeat. But the praise God, even though that's true, and you do look at yourself and you do fall back in the flesh, stepping back into the spirit is just one step. It's called, oh Lord Jesus, Lord, I love you. Lord, thank you that you're with me. Thank you that you dwell in me. Thank you that I have you as my life. Thank you that your blood cleanses me of all my sin. And I am now a son of God, born of God, born from above, and that I can walk in the spirit, not by focusing on the spirit, but focusing on you, because the spirit testifies not of himself but of the one who sent him and he is here to take from jesus and to disclose who jesus is and what he's done to us and he gives him out to us as many many gifts every day he gives us a new gift where we get to see something of jesus and this becomes our pursuit and that's what it means to pursue sanctification without which what no one will see the lord so what is the goal is it sanctification or seeing the lord it's seeing the lord so why don't you just look, seek the Lord and see his smiling face 
everything else will follow from that. This is just a quick little teaching, but if you're more interested in this, the two messages I have that I think are some of the best messages um, that I gave was one is called besetting sin or overcoming besetting sin. Yeah, right. No, yeah, right. That's how it's supposed to read. And then the other one is uh, how to walk in the spirit by faith, which is part two of a bigger message uh, that was, how, uh, what does it mean to be born again? Um, I just cut out the second half of that and made it its own message that kind of stands alone. So um, anyway, have a good day. Talk to you later.